Okay, good afternoon everybody. Sorry for the way I just mounted the stage while there's steps everywhere and I just went like that. Uh, but I want to welcome everybody uh, to the talk about data in humanities and social sciences. So the talks we already had luckily mentioned data a lot. But um, yeah, please come with questions and um, I'm going to keep it... Okay, there's some slides with more content than others but I hope you can see um, the value of at least talking about this, starting a conversation, not being afraid of a word like data, not being afraid of what it can be, um, the vast amounts of data that is actually present in all of our work, um, irrespective of where in the humanities or social sciences we find ourselves. So just a structure uh, for the talk, just a small introduction, giving some context or motivation for any type of awareness of data amongst human, humanists and social sciences. And then what is data? I hope to get a lot of running with mics. I don't know who's the fittest after the cupcakes, but you shall be running. And then um, just linking to what is data, I want to also talk about what um, is metadata and the importance or not thereof, depending on the answers in the room. And then also the sharing of data, which we also heard um, already a few times this morning. And what is open science, open data. So as you can see, it can be a very comprehensive um, talk, but I only have a few minutes and you are all going to be part of the conversation, so I will condense where needed. And then licensing, but I see Douglas is not here. I hoped <laughs> he would stay here to talk about Creative Commons licenses himself. And then what a repository is, and then specifically referencing Sarila's uh, repository where a lot of data is already available. Um, if we can get to that. Otherwise, you can just stop me over a cupcake, over a coffee, or over wine, if you want to talk about the data in the repository, if we don't get to it. Okay, so first of all, just an introduction on the importance of data awareness in general. Uh, first of all, it is to highlight and to really drive home the value of data. So I'm using this word a lot because the next <laughs> slide is where we're gonna get some answers hopefully from the group. And then also normally those of us who have worked with data know the labor intensive process of producing curating, using and making sense of data. So to be aware of your data overlaps with not letting all your energy and hard work go to waste. And then data can be seen as a form of output. A lot of academic journals these days are asking for primary data that you are basing all your research on. And then the reusability overlapping with how labor intensive it is to produce, and then for advancement in the field in general. So with that background on the importance of data, my runners are ready. What is data? We've heard it, I, I've maybe said it 30 times just now, but Prof Justice said, Jonathan said, they showed a lot of data, they shared a lot of data, but what is it? Information. Uh, information, we got you from the front. Okay. Okay, text as a form of data. Oh, here's a hand, here's a hand. Oral histories. Oh, these takes are going to run out fast now. <laughs> yes? So, we you get accumulated points and collection of data, you can actually derive something from it. So, I would say it's um, when it's accumulated, there's something that you can take from that. So, there's knowledge that it can create okay. if it's together. So, it's like data inception. Yes. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. Yes, this table is on fire. Um, images yeah. and maps, geographical data. Beautiful. 
Okay, so the next question will come to that half of, oh no, there's a hand, there's a hand. She's saving this half of the room. Okay, so something that can be processed. Okay. Yeah, I think we have, um, except if there's somebody else who wants to answer. Any, yeah, sound, if you, I think the important word we have is accumulation, you know, but sound as a signal, as a form of, you know, yeah, communicating or, you know, linking with text. So sound and text are forms of data. Yes, they had the back. Uh -huh. There we go. Yes. Wealth. Okay, data as a commodity. Yes, okay. Now I think we, as a room, have a grasp on different types. So data has different forms it can take, different uses. But the amount, if we look at the wealth of data we can accumulate, it is definitely a commodity um, for researchers. So if we can consider this um, short definition about data, we could define data in the humanities as all materials and assets scholars collect, generate, and use during all stages of the research cycle. So, if you close your eyes for a moment and just imagine the research cycle when you start, when you do drafts, every time you write a draft, that's a form of data. You can go back and reference, okay, this is what I did. This, the data you start with before you start processing, that is data. When you start categorizing everything, that's other data you add, so you augment, you create meaning from points, from sound, when you annotate it, from text when you start extracting, you are only interested in certain words or certain lemmas or every time you distill something from a bigger whole to make sense that you can explain why you did that. Why is it important that you are looking at that small piece that is data? And then so data could therefore include data sets so I'm referencing corpora as corpora can be speech or text or any collection um, of related data points in the form of text or words, word lists, frequency lists, interviews. I think a lot of people here work with interviews. I know of one lady working with Atlas TI, um, creating meaning from those transcribed interviews, uh, qualitative questionnaire answers that you combine into a data set, then even your methodology and process to create code or describe the methods you use to extract data is also data. It is something somebody else can use and credit you for, thank you for this process, I would not have known where to start. Um, and then a workflow and then ultimately executable files, software people create has data now, is data, and you can then process more data with it. So these are just examples, but everything mentioned here is also examples. So, coming to this side of the group, what is metadata? Or oh, anybody, no, I'm just teasing, anybody. Information about your data, okay? Yes. Keywords, yes. Descriptors. Okay, yes. The Easter eggs are going fast. Sorry, Knox. <laughs> yeah, no, okay, so I don't data see. Data about data. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> that one. So, data about data, yeah. So, it's, I think it helps you know what's inside the data or where to find if you don't necessarily know where to download it, you have the email address of the person who created it and you can ask, can I please get this? I want to use it, um, is it possible? So metadata says how big are the files, what type of files are in there, describing what you're gonna find if you open this. You have 12 columns and they have these abbreviations and they mean this. So anybody can know, okay, so maybe I can use this person's data 
I'm only interested in the fifth column. So I can extract that and say, okay, thank you, I used yours, but I have my own derived from yours. Okay, and then part of data, metadata, and the whole idea we have about sharing data directly links to fair and care principles of data management and data curation. So FAIR principle stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Are all those words normal words for everyone? <laughs> so just findable really connects to the metadata that you know, okay, this website has geographical maps of South Africa. So you can go find the data there. So that is a first step of good data curation is making sure even though you don't necessarily give people direct access to your data, it might be sensitive, there might be addresses, there might be ages, um, and all that very sensitive data, but you make it findable by saying, okay, I spent six years on this project, we accumulated this type of information from people from this region, if you are interested, contact me directly. So that makes it very findable. And then accessible, is on the website, it's through my email, it's hopefully um, in a format that everybody can use, non-proprietary format. So not necessarily with software you have to pay for to use because that makes it less accessible to a lot of people. Interoperable, meaning if it's in a flat format you can use it in different programs. So the more formatting you use, the more colors you use in Excel, <laughs> the, more, the less interoperable you make your data for other people to use who do not necessarily have access to a program like uh, Excel. And then reusable, overlapping with interoperable, that I want to use your data for something else, so I need it in the most basic form it is before you start putting tags and everything you um, connect with your study. And then just um, the care principles are a bit more recent, um, especially with reference to um, sensitive data that has to do with kids or indigenous peoples, that there should be collective benefit when you share your data, that the community should benefit from that. There should be somebody who has control over the sensitive data, so authority to control that data responsibility and ethics. So I think that's also going into philosophy and hopefully, yeah, I don't see Prof. Justice's wife here, so I can't <laughs> direct it to her anymore. But yeah, those last four are a bit more uh, intense and I think relevant to people working with really sensitive data. Okay, that you can see the slides will be accessible later. Um, I just included this box really. Um, also just summarizing findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. But yeah, I don't expect anybody to read that now. And also a fair data self-assessment tool that you can go use on the website of uh, the Australian Research Data Commons to assess for yourself, it's free to use there to assess for yourself how fair your own data is. So they ask you questions like, does it have metadata? Is it downloadable? Is it on a website? Does it have a paywall? Do you have to log in? So all those things uh, that influence basically the score this tool gives you for the fairness of your, of your data. And then I first want to, okay, so open science, open data, uh, I'm not this, quite a lengthy paragraph, basically coming down to sharing what you have, making it open, making it accessible, findable, reusable, all those things um, we discussed. So unfettered public dissemination, a shift in thinking about ownership of data, um, so that thing about benefiting from others' work, not without acknowledging their work, but seeing it as we are advancing the field um, rather than enriching just ourselves and our own minds, um, which should be part of the process, but not the whole process. So my next question, I hope there's Easter eggs left. Um, is open data always a must? Everything must be very open, free, 
I see, a, I see at least a few heads twitching. Okay, so if no or if yes, why? Sorry, I had to put that on the slide. This is not just a one mark question. It's more than one mark. Yes. Oh, sorry, just give, yeah, just give the mic, sorry. Hi, can everybody hear me now? Yes. So it depends if there's a policy that um, restricts you, that it can't be open accessible. Okay. Um, there is also sometimes embargo of uh, scientific material that's not yet been published, so in that regard it can't always, you can't just generalize, it can always be open. Okay. It would have been nice because the NRF got a policy that all data for research must be open, but they keep into mind that certain restrictions as well. Yes, uh, somebody, okay, it's their hand. Okay, I think testing, the, testing. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think it's always a must, but I think it should, should change from being, uh, now it's optional to it should be the default, and you should then have to justify why it's not going to be open, if there are policies, reasons, privacy issues, whatever the case might be. So it should be the default with an opt-out clause, rather than now, in many cases, if you feel like it, it is open. Mm. Okay, so, uh, so you mentioned like the one thing might be privacy issues. So that might be a reason to not have the data open. Okay, there's another one. Okay, this is from a virtual participant again. I think it should be, and if sensitive, can be anonymized. Okay, okay. And then I want to deal with the anonymized quickly, but then... Okay, so okay maybe I should first deal with that. So I think that's a good comment or suggestion, but what happens if it's anonymized and somebody says, please remove my data? Because they have that right now, and you don't know where to find it. So that's just a question, that people these days, if they filled in a questionnaire, they have the right to tell you, please do not use my answers. So then you should know how you were anonymized or pseudonymized or scrambled your data so you can go find this very one particular person's answers and take it out. So it's just a question with another question. But I think it is, yeah, depending on the nature of the data. But yeah. Um, in my experience, there's a, there are many reasons to, um, for, for material not to be available to the public. Um, copyright is one thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's a huge thing, copyright, especially because um, I'm in uh, music archives. That's one thing. But I mean, it's also with, with any kind of art production um, works that's, you know, not necessarily only music, but also books or poetry or whatever it is um, that, that uh, produces royalties, that's one thing. But then you also have something about um, sensitivity of materials, especially politically sens sensitive materials. Um, I have come across many, many problems uh, with students who have worked on sensitive material, uh, and then we've had many problems afterwards. Um, and, um, and theses and stuff that were sen yeah, censored. Yeah because of um, sensitive material. So they are, it, it's really a very, it's a minefield. Yeah. No, I think, yeah, so basically what we, I think just can summarize is that open data is not always the be all and the end all because it depends on the nature of your data um, and stuff like copyright, how sensitive the material could be, how possibly yeah, sensitive, the other word is um, like offensive probably uh, to some people, even though if you put a message saying, if you download this, just be aware that it contains this type of content. Now you can do that, but then I would propose you only have metadata and have somebody contact you and saying, okay, I know um, you worked on offensive things because I read an abstract or your article, but I'm still interested in the data. You know, then you have the paper trail of somebody asking you for it, so afterwards they can't say, you know, these were really terrible things. Okay, 
but yeah, these are very long discussions to have and uh, definitely something to be cognizant of either from now on or still um, when you work with any type of student, your own work, um, to be very sensitive to what are they going to do, what are you going to do, and what is the best way to make it as accessible as possible, but as restricted as necessary. So I think that's very important to just think that in humanities, we want to help each other, I hope. Um, but sometimes you also need to think about the people that helped you finish the study. And you can't really just say, it was government money, I'm making it open for everybody, and they get all the information. It's not as easy as that. So licensing of data, um, uh, I almost see my red poster, but uh, so there's Creative Commons licenses that have different meanings, so I put up all those. I think it's all the combinations you can have, and Douglas is still not here. But uh, you can go read all of it on the Creative Commons website, so it helps people understand what they can do with your data once you have put this license on it. Can they use it for commercial purposes? Is it totally free? Is it in the public domain? Almost. Uh, and can they remix it? Can they reuse it? Should they use it only as what you published it online? So that's how you decide how it's licensed. And we can discuss that also somewhere. Um, and then where can data be stored? So without going into too much interactivity, which I actually loved and now. I get red flags. I am not a red flag, I see red flags. Um, but, so data, ideally, not everything necessarily online. There's secure and more secure ways of storing data. Uh, so just remember that. And then one option is to use a repository. A lot of the institutions uh, represented here by all of you today have institutional repositories where your data can go, or it has a different URL, uh, like um, Jonathan's newspapers, it, it gets hosted somewhere. So a repository has this idea of a secure online platform where you either publish the metadata and or a downloadable file with information on what is inside, what was it used for, and can you reuse, so just with the licensing. And then Sarilar has a specialized repository um, mainly aimed at linguistic, different types of linguistic sources. So FAQs we can't do, but please keep the cues and more flags. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benito. Um, I think we have time for like two questions. Two questions. Two questions or a comment, something going once, going twice, okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>